Hi everyone, welcome back to the Hormones in Harmony podcast. Today I'm joined by my guest Keith Littlewood to talk about a few different things, so nutrients and foods for hormone health, importance of light exposure and improving your um, metabolism and carb tolerance, so a few different things. So for those who aren't familiar, Keith Littlewood spent the first 25 years of his career in the fitness and rehab industry, working around the world, helping clients get out of pain and get stronger. Now he works as an independent researcher and coach, studying the effects of the environment and endocrine responses, also working as a coach globally with those who want better energy, digestion, mood, fertility, pain, and other hormone-related outcomes. He holds degrees in fitness, health, and endocrinology, with additional studies in neuroscience, nutrition, rehab, sleep biology, functional medicine, and provides seminars to both clients and clinicians on a variety of related topics. So welcome to the podcast, Keith. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And before we get into the questions, because I have a lot of them, what was it that made you transition from a fitness coach into more of a researcher with a particular interest for hormones and gut health? Right. So about 10, 11 years ago, I got really interested in the works of a guy called Ray Pete, who kind of got me thinking a little more than I was. I was very dogmatic in my approach to nutrition. I'd studied a few mechanisms of rehab and, and pain science and neuroscience. And I, I think that the uh, 2015, I wanted to go a bit deeper. So I applied to do a, a master's in endocrinology. Um, and then, you know, last year, when the problems started around the world, I, I, I decided to stop doing therapy work, primarily just because uh, there are constraints to it. And I kind of, I really wanted to throw myself into doing something more meaningful. And, and that's why I, I kind of put, put forward to do a PhD in, in, in you know, hormones and environmental factors. Uh, so it's been coming for the last 10 years. And then I, I, I went back to uni to study endocrinology. Uh, and I, I really want to try and do something that adds to the conversation around treating hormones effectively, because I, I just don't think there's enough thinking about how to, to manage the, the problems of uh, environmentally kind of dysfunctional hormone responses as it were and is it is it you also that has struggled with health and yeah. hormone issues or is it that your clients that you were training maybe weren't improving because of hormone imbalances or a bit of both sure so i went in the uh, kind of mid 2000s into kind of a orthorexic kind of approach to health and fitness paleo low carb you know no sugar salt dairy really boring really uh, annoying person to be around <laughs> um and, and i was okay with that and i kind of got into the more kind of metabolic side of things and just eating on a regular basis eating really good foods uh, and then i had all my mercury teeth drilled out at once at about six mercury fillings and my thyroid just hit the floor i gained 10 kilos in the space of a couple of months i was feeling shivery and cold i, I used to play football and i'd come away from that and my body temperature would be down at 34 and a half degrees after a couple of hours after playing football and you know I got constipated and not great sleep pretty pretty grumpy and that's that was kind of pushing me more into kind of getting getting a better understanding of hormones and uh, the many stresses that can interact or converge to create problems and for me it was uh, uh, probably uh, mercury vapor from having my amalgams drilled out that that caused my problems. And people might be listening and thinking, wait, what? You, I talk about all the time the importance of having your amalgams removed and avoiding some of these heavy metals in the environment. So with you, I'm guessing it was either that you didn't go to a functional holistic type dentist or you, it was just too much at once. I did see a functional holistic type dentist. And I think the only thing that they did was put a dam in my mouth. Mm. Uh, there was no kind of after thoughts on, on supplements, which I should have been thinking about, to be honest, anyway. But I, I probably I wasn't thinking at the time I was going off on uh, honeymoon, and getting stuff done. Wedding was around then. So I probably didn't put as much care into it as I, I could have done. But I, I still think, uh, you know, uh, it's pretty tricky to get all of the mercury vapor coming off when you're drilling out six mercury tea. So who knows, uh, you know, but it certainly it hit me. And I, I think it was kind of also that the artifact of you know, late 20s into early 30s, still going out and partying and, and playing a lot of football. I used to play three league games of football a week. I, didn't, I wasn't very good at it, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, and not understanding the, the, the proper uh, rest and uh, regeneration strategies. So I think that was, you know, the, the final straw that broke the camel's back, as it were. And that's got what got me uh, into, into studying um, thyroid physiology and reproductive physiology and uh you know hormones uh, generally more to be honest and you mentioned things like 
paleo diets and I mean, that is a generally like better than the standard Western diet. But yeah. I see in my clients as well that people take it to the extreme and they cut it one food group and feel great. And then it's like more and more and more and they start to um, exercise. They feel good. They're losing weight. And then they take that to the extreme. And I've definitely that's how I started my health journey as well with um unintentionally under eating I was just trying to eat healthy but that consisted of salads and grilled chicken and rice just like the basic boring diet that people think of when they think of health but yeah how is it that being too healthy isn't actually a good thing yeah well I kind of call it the kind of zone zone of dogma creation is where people will switch diets and whether you switch from anything like high carb to low carb meat eating to vegan or whatever that whatever the strategy might be there's going to be a window of gains because it's something different sometimes it's calorie restriction that's part of that sometimes it's kind of you know if you're eating certain junk foods there's lots of things that are added into that that you're going to notice some benefits when you cut them out but then like say with a whole food diet if people are going down the road of kind of eating you know lots of brown rice instead of white rice as an example lots of undercooked green veggies lots of seeds and nuts a lot of these foods can converge again to have a an effect on health because you know a lot of plants have developed toxins to, to protect themselves and in particular case of like say the brass, brassica vegetables as an example you know kohlrabi kale bro uh, broccoli cauliflower uh, spinach and all these other things you know unless you're cooking them really really well they can have a specific effect on slowing down thyroid and if you're also adding into the mix not getting enough carbohydrate in that can have an effect on liver function thyroid function and then you start to see kind of alterations to sleep or you know if you're trying to digest a lot of raw and uh, poorly digested food and lots of fiber it can have a specific effect on irritating the bowel and again this converges to disrupt sleep and digestion and becomes a bit of a vicious cycle energy becomes lower you, you go through the day kind of scraping through because you haven't had enough sleep and, and that's where we can start to see these kind of problems occur from perhaps being too healthy so there's there is a, a fine line to tread on because don't get me wrong, eating lots of good whole foods, I think particularly plenty of fruit is a, is a great idea, good quality dairy and meats and proteins. But I think a lot of people can go into the, you know, overdoing the veggies, overdoing this kind of alkalizing type diet. And I, I think not to point the finger at some, but I've worked with enough yoga instructors who've kind of gone down the route of being vegans and that they've had some real health problems. Um, and so there, are, there's, there's, there's context to the person uh, and the type of diet they're eating. But sometimes a lot of these diets, they tend to be not sustainable. And that's the trick for most people is getting a diet that gives you enough energy, doesn't cause bowel inflammation, gives you enough energy to get through sleep the night, support optimal hormone responses, uh, and a gamut of other things that give a person a good idea of whether they're healthy or not. It sounds very counterintuitive, doesn't it? To maybe eat less vegetables and fiber in order to have less constipation. We usually told the opposite, oh, just drink more water, eat more fiber, but it after, often makes people with this sluggish condition and hypothyroidism even more constipated and bloated. Yeah, and if, uh, unfortunately, females are typically, uh, um, you know, um, suffer from that because if you're females are ten times more likely to suffer from low thyroid, uh, autoimmunity, depending on how you look at that, the concept of that. But you know, you then go on that kind of raw green diet does, doesn't give them much energy, slows the thyroid down, difficult to digest, flood themselves with multiple liters of water, end up going to pee a lot, pass out lots of minerals, cools the body down challenges the body because the metabolic rate is going down and they're cooler anyway and so you know then they're waking up to pee at night and there's the, again it, it's kind of trying to say well actually what you think is healthy is if it doesn't support good energy sleep digestion mood fertility libido absence of pain is it really working for you and i, I think there are really basic questions to give someone a good idea of whether their strategy is working for them or not so would you say those symptoms and um, indicators that you just listed are key signs of a healthy metabolism absolutely yeah yeah uh, and you know and uh, feeling warm is is a, is a good thing and you know how many female clients you've spoken to say they're cold all the time cold hands cold feet cold nose could come from um you know just not getting enough energy and could come from hormones not functioning as well as they could do could come from gut inflammation that's not letting them absorb their nutrients properly but again going and flooding yourself with kind of multiple liters of water is the last thing that someone needs but yet people are told drink cold water because it, 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 it increases your metabolic rate. Well, actually it kind of slows it down even more. Uh, and, you know, just like tenses right up. 
Yeah, and if you're prone to edema and swelling, which can be influenced by, you know, a high estrogen, low progesterone state, you're kind of more prone to that puffiness and edema. And the last thing you want is kind of your body swelling up because it, you know, uh, that, that can, you know, feed into many different states, whether it's PMS, you know, uh, cycle disruption, thyroid disruption, and all the other things that go with it. And could you talk about the benefits um, that you see in testing your temperature and pulse as opposed to other biomarkers that other practitioners might use, such as blood sugar or ketones or heart, um, not heart rate, but um, maybe oxygen rate or anything like that? Sure. Well, the, the original kind of, uh, you know, suggestion was kind of based on the, in the 30s and 40s where you could test metabolic rate. But if you're using something as simple as a thermometer and you could assess both the armpit and the mouth to get an idea of someone's heat expression, which is dictated by thyroid to a degree. There are uh, certainly nuances to it because, you know, uh, you can have people who are hot or are cold, people are just right. Some people might be stuck in a chronic stress response pathway where they're producing more adrenaline and cortisol. So there can be some, you know, gray areas that you need to tease out with someone. But I think it's pretty good, a good, useful uh, benchmark for understanding how healthy someone is, because if your body temperature is low, enzymes don't tend to function in the same manner that they could do. So uh, if, you, if you find someone that's low, getting their heat up is a, is a really useful marker of success. And the same, same with pulse rate to a degree. If your pulse rate is permanently low or kind of, you know, below 70s all the time and, uh, or, or running above 90s chronically and into the hundreds, these are kind of two end ranges where, again, more problems to occur. And again, there are nuances to finding out whether someone's running off the stress response, more adrenaline, more cortisol, um, or kind of someone's kind of having this bradycardia or low heart rate that some people kind of have as a badge of honor of how fit they are, but it has no real implication on how healthy they are. So I think these markers are really, really good. Uh, and there's a really interesting piece that came out on uh, viral susceptibility. It's people that actually presented with a low body temperature prior to going to hospital actually had a worse outcome. And that, that what that suggests to me, and it's very much implicated in, in, in thyroid function, is if your body temperature is low, your immune response is also lower because the thyroid controls has a has a key um, uh, driving force in, in immune system production, whether it's blood cell production, white blood cell production, bone marrow production of blood cells, hematopoiesis, you know, the production of red blood cells. And if, if you're not having uh, uh, optimal kind of blood and immune response pathways and perhaps your heat, the, the amount of body heat you have is a suggestion of that. If they found that the people who went in with lower body heat actually had much higher body temperatures pushing towards the 40 and over mark, that was suggested that they were going to have a much harder time and mortality was even higher in the people that had low temperature to start with and they progressed higher and higher, which means to a sense is that you can't thermoregulate and control your body temperature efficiently. So I think thermoregulation, and bearing in mind most mammals, regulate their body temperature at about 37 degrees centigrade. Some people argue there's, there's a study that came out, I think last year or, or the year before, and they said, oh, we don't know why human body temperature is reducing. And I'm like, well, if you understand that the environment's a much harsher place and key hormones of you know, coherence and organization are being disrupted, and particularly thyroid physiology, which can be implicated in heart disease, cancer, infertility, uh, low immune responses, then you can understand why people's body temperatures are reducing. It's certainly not some, you know, uh, wonderful, um, uh, you know, uh, example of evolution that we're getting cooler. It's actually an example of it, I think, of we're actually degrading more reproducing hormone uh, people or organisms that aren't as healthy as they were previously we have a, a lot more industrial pollution and that's driving this response down so that, that's why i think body temperature is is a is a very good sign of metabolic health and you can extend that into seasonal winter months as well you know people that feel lower you know just don't function that well perhaps even seasonal affective disorder as an example. Uh, and it's well known that TSH, the, the pituitary hormone that's responsible for stimulating more thyroid, generally increases during winter, which could suggest that some people go into a subclinical low thyroid state simply because it's colder, there's not enough light around, and that there are, uh, there's a lot more metabolic stress for some people. So what did you say the ideal ranges were for body temperature? 
Well, I think on waking, 36 and a half degrees um, is, is useful in both mouth and the armpit. I think the mouth is the last place you're going to see a decrease in body temperature because the brain likes to use vast amounts of glucose. The skull is quite thick. Heat dissipation is generally poor. But in the, in the trunk, as an example, in the armpit, I think that's a really good uh, indicator that the armpit should be in line with the, with the mouth. So 36 and a half degrees on waking in a fasted state, you can imagine glucose becomes decreased overnight we will use up a certain amount that can could, could give some people an idea of why they're not sleeping throughout the night if you can't regulate your blood sugar levels you're going to stimulate pathways that generally wake you up because it requires adrenaline and cortisol to to kind of maintain the blood sugar responses so you know uh once you had a good feed after breakfast for example your temperature should go to the optimal around about 37 degrees centigrade so that, that that would be the mark that i would be looking at and that's generally in line with with most mammals is a temperature temperature regulation of 37 degrees and i'm guessing that's the same for men and women but then women have yes. the um increase and the spike of temperature in the luteal phase after ovulation could you talk about that and what a healthy range might be there Sure, I, I still think around about the 37 degrees more, you might see pop, uh, popping slightly over in a, in a healthy female. Uh, it's generally something that you don't see in a lot of females, primarily because during the luteal phase, if there's been a, a, a very big rise in the follicular phase and, and a, a large production of estrogen, it will inhibit how much progesterone is being produced. Sometimes when there's deficits within, say, not enough vitamin A, um, for the corpus luteum to produce enough progesterone, you may not see that that um, you may not see that uh, being maintained or increased from a body temperature perspective. Estrogen can, estrogen can lower body temperature, so you can see this spilling over into the luteal phase, and that can be a reason why you don't get this progesterone boost. And bear in mind that estrogen can inhibit thyroid hormone at multiple levels, which also can have a negative effect on, on the luteal phase as well. I mean, progesterone should be being produced throughout the, the whole month. It's just at, at different levels. But, you know, in that follicular phase, estrogen tends, tends to dominate. It stimulates glycolysis in, in the reproductive tissues, kind of stimulates tissue growth, perhaps ready for implantation if pregnancy is going to be successful. So uh, generally, as a rule of thumb, I think there are, should be some small variations, but I'm still looking to, to for an optimal rate of 37 degrees. That would be my marker for everybody. And I always say balancing blood sugar is like the foundations. If you can't do that, then the hormones, the sex hormones, the most surface level issues and the sleep um, and the low energy problems as, are as a result of that. So apart from eating regularly, like you mentioned before, what other things affect blood sugar? And are there any other tips that we can implement to stabilize things? Yeah, well, but again, you know, progesterone can uh, improve the amount of glucose that's available within the blood and progesterone is a is a pro uh, metabolic hormone, it stimulates, you know, um, aerobic respiration, so you should be able to use carbohydrates more efficiently. So uh, estrogen can lower body temperature, it can play habit with blood glucose levels. Uh, it can inhibit thyroid hormone, as I said, in both carrier proteins, and it can also uh, have some disruptive effects on the aerobic metabolism. So when our aerobic system doesn't work efficiently, glucose doesn't work efficiently, it's not, it's not utilized, so the body will switch, you know, in, in, in something called the glucose fatty acid cycle, which is switching away from glucose to fatty acid oxidation. And if this is chronic, this can cause problems, you know, uh, in, in specific tissues, as an example, as I said, estrogen does stimulate uh, glycolysis rather than aerobic respiration. That means that there's not enough carbon dioxide also being produced. So low levels of carbon dioxide, high levels of estrogen can synergize with the kind of low progesterone and low thyroid state that also go into disrupting optimal blood sugar responses. So I think that's, that's really useful to consider those implications. Um, I, I think from a blood sugar perspective, getting adequate light is, is always going to be very, very helpful. And that's just one of the things that we can do, whether it's getting enough light outside, perhaps in these months using some artificial lights that, that are going to help out. You know, you mentioned like eating on a regular basis. I think that can be helpful. I mean, PMS, I, I believe is, is, is generally uh, a combination of blood sugar dysregulation, low progesterone, and sometimes low thyroid. It could you know, also spill into a vitamin A deficiency again, as we talked about those structures 
uh, like the corpus luteum not producing enough progesterone so they would be my main things you know and we also tend to waste salt as well so even getting adequate salt in the in the premenstrual phase can go some way to maintaining metabolic rate stop you passing out lots of salt also uh implicated within you know as thyroid becomes lower you pass out more salt and also waste magnesium so these are all these other kind of cofactors and nutrients that can be considered for, for regulating better temperatures re regulating better blood sugar responses and uh, not letting estrogen run away you, you know we know that estrogen isn't necessarily bad but its capacity to uh, you know whether it's being produced within the body or there's many factors externally like phytoestrogens plastics in the air combustion engines in the air um you know even home products you know whether it's teflon you know coated products and all of that, these other things that converge that have a very estrogenic response so i think it's 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 mindful to understand that you know estrogen levels can be effectively increased by lots of things external to a, a woman's body um and I think getting a better idea of those can, can help some way for, for managing some of the symptoms that, that occur. Um, yeah. And when you said light exposure using some sort of device, do you use red, red light or some of these like um, light therapy boxes? I think anything, even just in, incandescent bulbs are going to give you some light that stimulate, you know, uh, health, health responses. Uh, I'm a big believer in, in you know, photobiomodulation and red light exposure. I think that's very, very helpful. But like I said, you can get some good incandescent bulbs. You don't have to spend much. You can get some reasonable lamps as well that are pretty cheap, like 30 or 40 quid that do the job really, really well. Um, I think getting out in the light, you know, even, even in winter, getting out during the daylight can be beneficial because you are getting sunlight exposure. Obviously, vitamin D is substantially decreased uh, during that time from sunlight. Um, uh, so, you know, I think it, generally most people will have <laughs> appreciate when spring comes along and temperatures warm up and, you know, uh, they're exposed to light a bit more. And I, I, I think that explains why people kind of enjoy going in and out of the season. So I explain why I'm actually kind of I've lived in the sunshine, which is pretty much here 24-7 for the last 10 years. And I'm looking forward to, to moving back to, to colder climates. But how many people do you know who get older and go, I want to emigrate where it's sunny all the time? And I, I think that's a, a useful indicator of failing biology when you don't like the cold, you don't like seasonal changes, and you want to be surrounded by sunshine all the time because it can prop up, prop up your, your health to a degree. It's a bit like exercising day in, day out because you, you like the way that exercise brings your temperature back up, but then you're kind of almost addicted to kind of exercising every day because it makes you feel better. If you stop exercising for a couple of weeks, that shouldn't harm anybody. But people, some people say, I don't like it. I get stiffer. I get more irritable. My sleep's worse. My menstrual cycle gets worse. My testosterone levels tank. You know, there's a number of things that can happen when you ask someone to stop exercising. I'm not ever asking anyone to give up exercise. I think exercise is a, is a wonderful anti-aging and, you know, increasing robustness for, for most human beings. But if you stop exercising for just a week or two and you feel really terrible because of it, you're masking the symptoms. And I think it's the same thing with light as well. It's, you know, you can do these things to keep propping the body up, but understanding the underlying physiology that, that creates the problems in the first place is, is key. So, you know, trying to find that the key thing that's wrong. And sometimes, you know, when you see something like thyroid hormone, there are a number of reasons why, why it becomes suppressed. Yeah, there's a lot of clients who I tell to exercise less again. It's like completely, especially like PCOS clients and thyroid clients that are told by the doctors, you just need to lose weight. You need to eat less, exercise more. And yes, they might feel good in the moment with exercise, but then yeah. they have a week off. They're like, see, I'm exhausted without it. My body loves exercise, but I'm like, no, that's your true energy. It's rock yeah. bottom. Yeah. And, and I would argue, and this is, this is my bias. I think all PCOS clients are thyroid clients. Yeah. I just don't, I just don't think that, uh, you know, there are a number of reasons why, you know, cystic ovaries occur, you know, probably you see this commonality is one of the most common uh, features of clients with PCOS is disordered eating in their teens. Mm -hmm. uh, that, for me, that's a big thing. Mm -hmm. And that's part of when I go back and if they're, they're suffering from endometriosis now, fibroids, infertility, or thyroid responses, you can see that disordered eating. Now we know not, not getting enough calories in suppresses T3 production. 
And, and that necessarily isn't always going to come back with adequate food. In some cases, refeeding does, but there's been enough stress and the environment maintains its complexity and stressfulness. And that's why kind of assessing thyroid becomes problematic because as you know, that when you don't eat enough, when you're kind of stressed, the glucocorticoids uh, and cortisol uh, will bind to things like progesterone receptors. They'll inhi inhibit the production of TSH. And this is why looking at a thyroid blood test can be completely at odds with, with clients uh, and what you're seeing because the clinical presentation is screaming low thyroid, but the blood test is saying, well, I don't think it is. And most clinicians will just kind of brush people away and go, TSH is fine. Even the T4 or free T4 looks good. So you can't have that. Um, I, I give you a, an example today. I've got a client I'm working with in Australia and she's been taking, uh, doing some really, really good things. And she switched thyroid brand. It's clearly not worked because in the space of literally eight weeks or four to six, maybe eight weeks, I can't remember exactly. Her TSH has gone from a 0 0.5, which I think ideal, up to 8.4 or something. And she said, is that normal for that to happen? And I said, it is when your body's responding and it's in a very healthy state, because what will happen is when your thyroid is decreased or is, it, there's not enough conversion going on, the pituitary or the stress response to produce TSH is a normal kind of backup mechanism to make sure that you produce more T fill and then T3. She's eating the right amount of food. She's doing well. She does moderate exercise and she's taking thyroid hormone. But the new brand that she's got hasn't been that effective. So her, her body is healthy enough to have that healthy TSH response. But in some clients, they're either stuck in excess exercise, stuck in excess stress, could be emotional stress, crappy relationship or job, uh, just overwhelming burden of stress or whatever form of stress, some form of chemical stress. And it's just not allowing that expression of TSH. And that's why some clinicians have said it can take years for someone's TSH to come up to where it looks like overt hypothyroidism. It might look like a subclinical state, but it's probably not going to get to that frank overt state until many months, months, maybe even years later, because the stress response is blocking the optimal pituitary response. And I, I think that's really interesting point to remember sometimes. Yeah, and I find your point about the um, disordered eating in teens with PCOS spot on for me. Like I'd never thought of that before, but yeah, I worked, I've got a PCOS diagnosis and that's like one of the first diagnoses that I had. Um, but I was thinking it was maybe more thyroid or hypothalamic amenorrhea at the time due to the fact it was triggered by over-exercising, under-eating. And now I'm just thinking of my other PCOS clients and that makes total sense. So obviously everyone's a little bit different in their treatment, but what would be kind of um, if someone came to you as a client and they had PCOS um, triggered by that disordered pattern in teenage years, let's say the mid twenties now, like how would you start? Um, well, obviously getting someone eating on an even keel and getting good nutritional responses is key. I, I do think that uh, assessing thyroid function, assessing body temperature, I think these are key. The reason why the cystic ovaries, and I, I, I can't remember the actual uh, Rotterdam kind of proceedings, it's been years since I've looked at it, but it's usually finding cystic ovaries, and there are a couple of other tests yeah, that define high probably. androgens, either symptoms yeah. or blood tests, and then um, yeah. anovulation, so like either irregular right. cycles or not ovulating. Uh, and, and uh, I think the anovulation is, is a key thing that there's usually an energy deficit or there's high estrogen, low progesterone that's driving that. Now, I've seen clients who, who haven't had a cycle for five years and the, the, within three months came back because I got her eating regularly and she started taking progesterone. I think that the, the findings of the cystic ovaries are, are, are a product of probably three or four things converging. Never underestimate the, the lack of nutrition, like, like we've just suggested. There are always environmental disturbances that could be a part of that. So any environmental pollutants that cause an estrogen-like effect that can cause any type of estrogen stimulation of tissues. We know what estrogen's primary role is. It's growth and production of new tissue. And we know that in various kind of reproductive orders, whether it's, you know, fibroids, uh, cystic breasts, endometriosis, there's a very high estrogen load that's driving that. So this causes the ovaries to respond in a similar manner. There's some infiltration of nerves. We get a very high sympathetic response. We get converging uh, effects of estrogen. We get suppression of thyroid. We get suppression of progesterone. Uh, and again, it, it get, a very important part is that eating phase. So it's understanding that, understanding what's in someone's environment, in understanding inheritable effects. You know, you'll see a lot of clients say, oh, I have PCOS. 
Um, but I think that's the same as when my mum had heart disease or my mum had cancer. There's something environmentally that's driving that response. It could be nutrition, it could be a pollutant within the environment that all converge that suppress this kind of progesterone thyroid axis. So I think most importantly is understanding what someone thyroid is doing because thyroid will give the response where estrogen can be detoxified. I use that term detoxified or metabolized efficiently at the liver. Again, the, 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 you can't ever underestimate the effects of the environment to cause that suppression of thyroid as well, because when we get the plastics, brominated flame retardants, uh, phthalates, some of the uh, pesticides that are around, certainly triclosan is another huge one from hand washing. It's, it's banned in some European countries, but it's still used around the world in various areas. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, some of the pesticides, they can converge to kind of at, at the kind of gene level, the genomic level and the non-genomic level by inhibiting metabolism, inhibiting liver function, inhibiting the ability to detoxify estrogen. And again, this has a primary effect on, on the ovaries as well. So I think thyroid is key for managing all of those factors, whether it's metabolism at the liver, uh, maintenance of the aerobic system, allowing progesterone to have that differentiating effect on tissues rather than estrogen kind of driving the bus and saying more tissue, more tissue, more tissue. And that would be the key thing for me is thyroid progesterone on a foundation of good food, making sure you're getting good light, even using things like carbon dioxide as an example to help stimulate the, 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 the metabolic processes. When we don't have good uh, aerobic metabolism working, we don't produce enough carbon dioxide. When we don't consume enough carbohydrates, we don't produce enough carbon dioxide. So having enough carbon dioxide can be helpful for sustaining this kind of optimal aerobic pathway, which estrogen and nitric oxide and a host of other things have the capacity to disrupt. Uh, and that's why I think the kind of the mutability, the cystic tissues can occur. Um, so yeah, I, that, that would be always my main thing. I wasn't succinct about that, but yeah, sorry. Another, no, another, that was great. Another environmental estrogen for me, I, I'm certain it was like a real root of my PCOS and everything else. Or again, it was just like the straw that brought the camel's back was mold exposure. So some of these yeah. mycotoxins can have estrogenic effects as well. And I know we were talking before I hit record about you having um, potential environmental exposures. Um, but I found that very interesting. And I just wanted to touch on the CO2 piece. Could like breathing or like uh, uh, the way that we breathe affect our health? I know that it does, but I want to hear your opinion. Yeah, I think in kind of end range thyroid states, you will waste carbon dioxide. So you can go from where you kind of in a hyperventilating state that, you know, you see how many kind of clients come across that are prone to hyperventilation. And the, the anxiety that you start to get with hyperventilation is wasting carbon dioxide. If you don't have enough carbon dioxide available, you can't relieve oxygen from hemoglobin. And so your, your ability, you feel like you're starving of air. And then you start hyperventilating because of your worrying. And that also brings you to respiratory alkalosis. It's where you don't have enough carbon dioxide available. Excuse me. So th this can be a, a real problem. So this is where something like bag breathing, carbon dioxide kind of exposure, altitude, taping your mouth, breathing through your nose, doing kind of drills, whether it's something like buteco, like a five, five, five on an inspiration hold and then exhalation. There are a number of things that you can do to, you know, increase the amount of carbon dioxide. You know, even having sometimes a little bit of bicarbonate of soda uh, can be helpful because it kind of increases the amount of something called carbonic anhydrase, which allows you to use carbon dioxide more efficiently and just can calm the system down a bit more. It's not really talking about the concept of acidity and alkalinity because um, there, there's a, a key point that's generally why our tissues are, are, are at a set state of pH and they should be slightly more acidic, particularly in the cell. And that stimulates the respiration and release of carbon, uh, release of oxygen from cells. But you can go too acidic or too alkaline and have both the same problems, which is essentially tumor production and also comas and death. If it's, if it's aggressive and, uh, you know, either uh, aggressive enough in the short term and will kind of just, uh, you know, slightly over in the chronic causing health problems as well. I mean, hy hypoxia is one of those key issues that leads to disease tissues, whether it's, you know, diabetes or cancer, you know, or hypoxia of the heart from aggressive metabolization, metabolism of, of fatty acids, because it doesn't have any flexibility in there. So. Yeah, you said something as simple as making sure that you're eating enough carbohydrates, 
plays into this as well. Like I think it's become less so, but the whole keto, really high fat, super low carb diets were very trendy a couple of years back. I think people are now seeing the detrimental effects of that a few years in, um, especially women. So a lot of women then try to reintroduce the carbohydrates and are having these crazy blood sugar swings. So could you talk about yeah. maybe the difference between certain carbohydrates and how to kind of slowly incorporate them back into your diet? Yeah, and, and it's a very common thing to go from a diet to, to go from quite a restrictive diet to find something that goes, oh yeah, I should be eating all of these things. And the first thing we do is, is go quite excessive with them. And if you haven't been using, if you've been kind of restricting carbohydrates, you know, the pancreatic function is significantly reduced. If you've been stressed, thyroid function is, is reduced. Thyroid will stimulate pancreatic uh, insulin production, just like it produces pancreatic enzymes as well. So if the thyroid pancreas axis is off, your ability to use carbohydrates is substantially decreased. If you've been prone to fatty acid oxidation without using carbohydrates and optimal use in the aerobic system, then that tends to be decreased as well. Um, I, I think it's important just to go slow and make sure you combine, you know, you get fats, proteins and carbohydrates. Um, I, I think, you know, you, if a lot of people become scared of, say, you know, fruit juice or fruits per se, but the amount of potassium that you get in these foods is very helpful for utilizing carbohydrates efficiently, getting optimal insulin kind of glucose responses. Uh, so it's often useful to go slow sometimes it's pragmatic to, to get people to go to say eating five to six meals a day simply because it gives them they've been so used to restriction running from pillar to post trying to get a result um the body doesn't know what it's doing so then you sit someone down and go right eat three meals a day uh, eat every three hours see how you get on and you you sometimes see that people get into that really really well some people don't respond to that really, really well. And I think finding out meal timings can be useful. Some people do really well on three squares a day. Um, but sometimes you've got the, the mood swings, the kind of um, drops, the sleep issues. I think eating on a regular basis is just, is just the most sensible thing to do. Try not to go too overboard. I mean, I think people should be able to tolerate a good 60, 70 percent carbohydrates in their diet. But you say that to most people, they just look at you as if they're crazy. But again, you know, athletes and people who exercise well should will use these amount of carbohydrates efficiently. And as I said, when it feeds into the respiratory quotient and optimal carbon dioxide production, this should make some sense. So I think this is why carbon dioxide, progesterone, thyroid, things like taurine um, and, and other uh, supplements like that can be pretty helpful uh, for uh, maintaining glucose metabolism but if you're low in progesterone and you're high in estrogen your, your glucose metabolism is going to be slightly wayward as if the, the the hierarchy above that the thyroids off then your ability to to utilize glucose is 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 pretty off as well and you, you look at metabolic syndrome there are so many studies that show that when you make someone new thyroid restore their thyroid function to have a relatively low tsh with good t4 and t3 levels you know decreased reverse t3 levels then their ability to, to kind of utilize glucose, lower cholesterol, lower the stress on arteries, improve liver function, uh, improve skin health, you know, tissue responsiveness, other hormone production like your, your steroidal hormones, like you know, adequate testosterone, DHEA, progesterone. This is this is just one thing that happens when you when you get thyroid functioning. So don't underestimate the fact that that, that if you don't have your thyroid working, you can keep eating as much of the what you perceive to be healthy foods it's going to be harder to regulate uh, metabolism and glucose regulation as such and why do we not need to be scared of fructose in fruit as opposed to high fructose corn syrup that we hear about in um, negative health related studies yeah so they're obviously very very different i mean fructose is actually quite useful because um it's just easier going than glucose um certainly if you kind of consuming high amounts of high fructose corn syrup it's devoid of other nutrients it doesn't have much potassium in it it isn't easier to kind of regulate a lot of people kind of look at something called the polyol pathway which is when there's uh, lots of glucose not being used efficiently and it goes via this pathway and the end product is producing lots of fructose 
as part of that pathway. And this is where fructose gets a bad name from. And then you see triglycerides being produced, you see non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this is very different when you're consuming a high, high fructose corn syrup with a very dense nutrient without any of the, the cofactors and, uh, and other minerals and, and nutrients that you get from say eating fruit uh, and, and, and fructose and sucrose and, and glucose, all the other fruits that you get with it. So, you know, I, I think high fructose corn syrup people have a good right to be wary of it but then the demonization that goes into kind of fruits and you know even something like white table sugar is um it's not too much fructose in that but as an example of, of, of kind of the demonization of carbohydrates is still unfounded because everyone still keeps uh, blaming glucose because the blood glucose levels are high and you say well what contributes to glucose being high why is it being utilized then you come back to perhaps aerobic respiration insulin function thyroid function overconsumption of fatty acids can be an example of that you know and, and overeating is, is a real thing as is under eating so again it's trying to get that balance uh, right and if you've got insulin resistance and high blood sugar through the roof just removing the carbs might help temporarily but long term you've still not fixed the underlying imbalances so as soon as you add them back in you're still going to get a bad response and that's why they are like yeah it must be the carbs because I feel better when I'm off them I feel worse when I'm on them but there's all of these yeah. other factors at play yeah I always kind of uh, laugh when I see these people saying my glucose responsiveness is is like you know my glu blood glucose levels have gone so low and it's like you're not consuming any glucose. But then there's a flip side to that, people who restrict sugar and actually their blood glucose goes even higher because they're dumping loads of fatty acids into the system, trying to you know, uh, keep running off gluconeogenesis, breaking down fats and potentially proteins. And if the system is degraded, that, that, that aspect of function that you really want to come back. But bear in mind, optimal use of glucose and glucose metabolism is an essential marker for health. It's like, it's, it's one of the most evolved mechanisms that we have is utilization of glucose, you know, and when we get became a, a abundance in, in, in kind of glucose, it was helpful for us to be able to use glucose efficiently. The argument that people say, well, you know, you don't need glucose because your body makes your own glucose kind of fails to understand that that's a fallback stress response. If you're running off that stress response pathway all the time, it will produce artifacts that are very negative, that will have long-term health consequences to, to your physiology. And that's why some people say, lost a lot of weight, feel great, running off adrenaline, they're kind of losing glucose weight initially from the liver. You know, they are, they do lose weight. And some people, you know, perhaps can tolerate these kind of small bursts of kind of carbohydrate restriction. Especially but men. At, yeah. And, but to look at it as, as a long-term uh, health strategy kind of, is, is kind of slightly ignorant of, the, of, of the, the, the optimal mechanisms that exist. And that's why some people uh, will go, you know, oh, I'm, I, you know, I'm bringing, I, I just find that if I cut carbs out, then the problems go. And it's, well, it's, it's a bit like saying, you know, when I don't eat, my digestion isn't so bad. <laughs> you're, not, you're not giving it anything to work with. That's why. And it's the stress some of the digestion. Some people say on these elimination diets, so they just end up on like five foods and they start to, the body starts to break down. Yeah, and it's, but it's, it's the stress, isn't it? The stress of the digestive system is why people can't tolerate, think they have an issue with dairy or they think they have an issue with carbohydrates. It's like that stress is the, the problem that needs resolving. If you understand why that system is broken down, the ability to use the things that you're scared of, is, is it, it comes back into play and it, it gets, gets back relatively quickly. It's a bit like caffeine as an example. How many clients do you know go, I don't, just don't tolerate caffeine, it makes me irritable and jittery. Well, if you're having it on, as the first thing when you wake up in the morning without having any food to stimulate, remember caffeine will act like thyroid and progesterone and it stimulates metabolism. That's why it's used as an ergogenic aid. So if you're trying to ramp up the system without having enough energy in the system, you're going to feel irritable, you're going to feel jittery, it's going to stop you sleeping because it has this kind of ramping up effect. And that's why, you know, people say, oh, I do, do much better on decaf but it's not the caffeine as such it's the person and also the quality of the coffee is extremely important if it's like a instant coffee or nescafe or some of this other crap then it's probably again contaminated with pesticides and mold and maybe that's giving them this um anxious irritable feeling 
I'm a bit of a coffee snob, so I would be inclined to agree with you. But, you know, you can argue that some aspects of microestrogens, I'd be more kind of concerned about, you know, grains as an example, have a, a really potent microestrogen called xerolinone, which is a, a thyroid disruptor. It's an estrogen sensitizer. So I think caffeine, for example, we should be mindful of perhaps of, you know, you know, where it's some some brands, I certainly wouldn't go instant as such. But, you know, boiled coffee uh, or kind of brewed coffee uh, certainly seems to make sense from a, uh, a health perspective, all the wonderful things it does. But, yeah, you can't get away from that, um, some things. But I think the generally the positive aspects of caffeine tend to outweigh what might be the what some people perceive as the ne neg negative connotations, especially from an uh, anti-Alzheimer's Parkinson's perspective, you know, pro-metabolic kind of perspective on, on the aerobic system. But yeah, it's something that, you know, if you feel that you are having an issue with something, you can cut it out and then reintroduce it. And, and uh, you know, if you can't tolerate it, you know, you could switch brands, for example, see if that has an effect. You could restore your blood sugar levels, see if you have the same response there, particularly for caffeine as an example. But yeah, there, there are sometimes many things to consider. Not to say, you know, I, I like to think of health, a lot of people in their general terms, a lot of people kind of look at it as go, I'll oh, go and do this gene test, look at your, you know, your uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, the SNPs, or look at, you know, genetic individuality. I think that there are some very general features of cellular health and mitochondrial health that we need to consider that everybody generally needs to keep chugging over at the same rate and there might be some very small micronutrient issues but i think on on a whole it's giving people enough energy uh being able to use that energy will, will drive the, the the productive and kind of the organized responses that we we seek for optimal health if that makes sense so what are some of these key nutrients and maybe the foods that they're found in that people need to eat more of if they're wanting to improve hormone health? So you mentioned coffee can be a superfood and some people might not think they might think of spirulina and kale, but I'm guessing they're not on your list. They're not. They, they never have been. Um, I, I generally would stay away from lots of I don't think brassica bread are that bad as such. But if you're eating plenty of them day in, day out and undercooking them, that's going to be a problem. I do think. Uh, uh, one specific one, which a lot of female, not all my female clients, a lot of clients go, yeah, I can eat that, is liver and retinol, because the, the, you cannot uh, uh, underestimate the effect of optimal kind of vitamin A from the pro-vitamin, sorry, the preformed vitamin A, the retinol that you find in liver. And I think just because it's an organ meat and awful that, that, that a lot of clients kind of balk at that. Or it seems that it seems a co common theme is that they were forced fed it when they were younger. Um, so I think liver, liver supplements can be helpful in that, that respect. But um, I think eating, eating liver, one, because it has a particular effect on skin health and immunity, hormone conversion, steroid hormone conversion. And we talked about vitamin A being a substantial part of the corpus luteum as an example. So if you, if you can get into the habit of eating one to two servings of liver a week, I would wholeheartedly recommend it. And you often see some blood values start to improve with that as well. When people get sick, for an example, and then they're kind of complaining of fatigue, you go and have your kind of serum iron blood tests done, your transferritin. Uh, and tissue iron binding capacities there are some nuances to that but sometimes if you've been ill then your vitamin a is also used up in that immune response and that's why both thyroid and vitamin a can converge to kind of bring you out of that hole but i, I do think vitamin a a, a lot of the thyroid cofactors selenium zinc oysters shrimp uh seafoods a bit of copper that that kind of thing which you'll get from liver as well uh, getting a healthy intake of those can be i think very useful for maintaining function and you know if clients are coming to me with either fertility or resolving pms uh, and uh, feeling generally better they would be the nutrients i would be looking for iodine not so much i think it's a very double-edged sword i've certainly seen clients go overboard with that we just even something like a, an oyster supplement uh, who are taking regular dates seem to stimulate some hyperplasia of the thyroid so i think trying to get it in the food form um, you know, a few oysters a week can be very, very helpful. So they will be my main ones. Uh, I think vitamin E can be very helpful as well. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they will be my main ones, really. The thyroid cofactors, the vitamin A, uh, eating adequate protein as well as carbohydrates is always useful uh, and moderate amounts of saturated fat. Uh, you know, getting the, the base nutrition and macronutrients right is, I think, is, is essential. And vitamin E is one that we don't really hear about in terms of supplements. If you're not in this kind of, 
a more metabolic world, uh, especially at college, we were taught like you never need to give vitamin E supplements, it can be harmful. Um, yet what could it benefit uh, in terms of symptoms and um, what foods are high in vitamin E? Sure. So, uh, for example, particularly people who have been prone to eating junk food, that, that you tend to have an abundance of the polyunsaturated fatty acids in tissues. And when they're utilized as a fuel, they tend to create um, lipid peroxides. These are kind of the metabolic byproducts that can damage metabolism. So they will kind of go through vitamin E. They will also utilize uh, glutathione. So that can become decreased as well. So vitamin E can spare glutathione as an example. So although it's an antioxidant as such, it, it, it kind of adds to the pro-oxidant cycle of oxidation and reduction with metabolism. So there, there are a number of studies. There's some really good old books from, I'm, I'm a sucker for old science books. One, because you can get them super cheap if you look in the right places. But if you look at uh, research by the shoots done in the, I think anywhere, I think it was like 50s and 60s and 70s, they showed that there were so many applications for using vitamin E, uh, whether it's kind of diabetes, heart disease, cancer, lots of different states. And, and I think in uh, restoring metabolic health, vitamin E can be very, very useful. Also useful if you're going out and you're eating a meal that you don't know perhaps the quality, if it's fried, for example, fried food, because it is oxidized fatty acids, particularly the polyunsaturated ones, that will lead to kind of more damage. You know, if you look at, say, the skin health, uh, aging spots, lipofus skin, which is an accumulation of kind of like iron and polyunsaturated fatty acids, prevention of these kind of uh, aging spots, vitamin E can be very, very helpful there as well. And how do you stay balanced with what you know? I know with your history of more of this orthorexia, tendencies and all of this knowledge whizzing around in your brain how do you stay balanced not to demonize things like the nuts and the seeds and the cruciferous vegetables and kind of have like somewhere in the middle yeah well yeah I, it's an interesting question i probably am pretty over being so anal about foods now i do i try to kind of practice what i preach i eat plenty of dairy I eat plenty of fruit. I'm sometimes a sucker for going for crunchy grains like sourdough and bread like that, which can be my downfall sometimes. Uh, and crisps would be my downfall as well. That's why I buy coconut oil crisps instead of like fried ones. So, you know, I don't drink that much these days. I kind of might have a glass of wine a week or the odd beer. Um, and, and I think the, the, the key is, is just uh, when, when you know when you're eating kind of away from the foods that you know have an effect and you've experimented so much, it's quite easy to notice changes to digestion and energy. So you end up falling off the pathway. So I'm not really anal about stuff. I tend to do stay away from plenty of fried food. I don't, you know, if I'm cooking at home, it's in coconut oil or olive oil as an example. But um, I think that, that the, I think it's very important to enjoy your food and enjoy the taste and enjoy the, the process of cooking and, and sharing food. So my, my, my advice is that, um, I think, I, I don't know, I, I'm trying to, to, to be succinct and it's difficult with this. I think try not to be too anal about your food. Look at, the, uh, we talked about those, those qualities of digestion, health, mood, libido, fertility, um, sleep qualities. If that, those foods, are, if, if you're having those, then potentially you probably don't need to worry about your foods as much as you do, uh, or, or not worry as such, but... Um, you know, have a look into the foods that might be causing a problem for you. Equally, I, I think, you know, worrying about foods all the time, it's about worrying about everything else within the environment. There are some things that you can be aware of, whether it's, if you can see kind of grey, hazy kind of pollution clouds over the city, you know, you know, there are certain things that you can do about it. And some of the things you can't do about it at all. So look what you can achieve to change within your own home and environment and what you potentially put into your body. I think eating organic food is always pretty useful because it does have less pesticide load. So that's something I strive for. But again, if it's like a grass fed meat and it's not organic, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, I kind of, you know, with milk, I, I like dairy. I prefer uh, raw milk I haven't been able to get that out here I've had pasteurized even ultra pasteurized milk out here and I'm not going to lose any sleep over it uh, because I'm more interested in getting adequate calcium within the diet and getting good dairy products so it's not it's not a big deal and I think once you've been through this kind of roller coaster of worrying about foods and what you can do and what you're eating and being really anal and annoying is not being annoying about your foods around other people is probably one of the best places that you can be totally agree and like going out to eat with 
people, just the socialization and um, the relationships that you can benefit from are going to outweigh the um, benefits of you sitting at home eating your quote perfect meal alone. Yeah, yeah. Um, don't get me wrong, I like sitting at home. <laughs> <I think laughs> it's really uh, nice, tasty food. And but yeah, I think there are many kind of connotations to food, whether it's social aspects and stuff. And I think if you stick to the basics of uh, avoiding lots of kind of processed fried foods, um, uh, but even going out to eat some junk food, you know, once a week or every now and then shouldn't be a big deal, shouldn't stress you out. You should actually enjoy the taste. And, you know, I go out for a burger at least once a week and I enjoy having a nice big fat burger. But, you know, I know that if I was going to eat that kind of day in, day out, my, my, my digestion wouldn't be off. So I'll eat kind of plenty of fruit or yogurt or kind of other things with breakfast, eggs and stuff. You know, there's, you, you get to a point where you just understand where you know what works. And what works for most people is easy. It's some very basic strategies is getting good quality, uh, you know, carbohydrates, proteins and fats in, in varying amounts and with plenty of the, the, the micronutrients that support optimal physiology. And the big burger and a beer every now and again will nourish the soul. So absolutely. <laughs> just, as, absolutely. just as useful. Cheese, is, uh, cheese, take cheese away from me. I'm going to start fighting people. <laughs> Love that. And I want to finish up uh, before we end the interview with a few questions for you. So the first one is, um, is the one supplement or food? So it might be the cheese or product um, that you couldn't live without. Yeah, cheese. Cheese? Cheese, for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, I do find that so I, it's easy for me to gain weight if I eat loads and loads of cheese. So sometimes I might go for a lower fat cheese or just have cheese kind of every other day. But I think that the, I think dairy is a superfood. I think it's a definition of a superfood for the wonderful nutrients it has, for the very high calcium ratio it has. So calcium, you know, dairy would be, um, would be one of my key foods that I think is essential. And it's an ancestral food that our body's kind of um, been consuming for hundreds, thousands of years, as opposed Absolutely. to these like new modern um, things that are coming out, these new like nut milks and all of these things. Well, I think they're a, a problem in the cells, notably because they also, also have a lot of kind of gums or gut irritants like carrageenan and vegetable oils in. But I think just for the, the purpose of getting optimal parathyroid function, keeping parathyroid low, you know, a diet that's high in vegetables and meats or cereals, for example, is going to be very high in phosphorus. Uh, so if you have, uh, if calcium is, is kind of below that phosphorus, uh, to calcium ratio you're going to get problems you're going to increase parathyroid you might be prone to tissue calcification and, you know an osteoporosis so i think this is why adequate dairy is essential and, you know the studies that are uh, are out there the meta-analysis on uh, cardiac protection uh brain function protection from dairy they're not to be sneezed at they're they're they're, they're very useful to consider the effects of dairy within the diet mm -hmm. it's very much demonized especially in like the plant-based vegan community and all of these documentaries, yeah, it's just crazy, the stuff that they're putting out. Yeah, I honestly don't think they know what they're talking about. I mean, half of it comes from funding and the, mm -hmm. the whole movement to kind of glorify plant-based uh, products. But, uh, you know, it just doesn't add up to me. Most of the, the kind of philosophy behind that is built on vast monocultures of crops, which destroy huge swathes of lands and, and, and loads of other animals and yeah. birds and insects and stuff. So the, the, there's hypocrisy all around and, and the... You know, nut milks are not healthier for, for human physiology. A absolutely no way at all. And even the dogmatic stuff that I was told that milk causes calcium to leach from bones, I haven't seen any study that's corroborated that at all. And I, I, I think when you understand how, how calcium, when it's dysregulated, leaches into the soft tissues, calcifies the arteries, calcifies structures in the brain, that you kind of get a better idea. But yeah, I, I, I don't buy that. And I think there's very little research that could ever come up to say that that consuming nuts, oats and rice milks are better than, than, than consuming milk. Just like Chinese whispers, isn't it, really? Yeah. You hear one thing, yeah. then just pass it on. And, yeah. Not it actually reminds... backed by science. Sorry? Not actually backed by science. Yeah, no. It reminds me of Gilbert Ling, who was a scientist who died a couple of years ago in 99, who's uh, credited with kind of coming up with the idea of the MRI. He said, you know, it's crazy that people think carbohydrates. He goes, I'm from China. He goes, all we ever used to eat was white rice. And he goes, there was one overweight kid mm -hmm. in, in my army intake of thousands of children. He said he was such a novelty. Everyone stared at him all the time. And this was like back in the, the 40s uh, or 30s in China. Um, 
And it, it's like, you, you, carbohydrates don't make people fat. It's like overconsumption of food makes people kind of overweight. Uh, dysregulation of thyroid hormone, kind of altered kind of, you know, leptin kind of hormone values. Dysregulation with estrogen can cause these issues as well. So, you know, there, there are a number of kind of things that people state, but on the surface, when you just even to scratch slightly below the surface, you realize that they just don't make any sense. Could not agree more with that one. And next question is, what's your go-to breakfast? So I'm pretty certain that you're not going to be in the skipping breakfast intermittent, intermittent fasting camp either. I'm a, I, do you know, my favorite at the moment, and I, I make like a big jar of marmalade once every two weeks. So I get all my kind of uh, organic orange peels and I make it with like two or three cups of sugar and a couple of shots of whiskey to give it some nice flavor. But yogurt, like plain, uh, I go for kind of like a lower fat yogurt with uh, big heaps of marmalade in. I'm equally happy with kind of sourdough toast with poached eggs or eggs on top. Uh, equally cook breakfast once or twice a week. Um, anything that's kind of got some protein and some decent carbs. Uh, I had Turkish eggs for breakfast this morning, which was equally nice. Mm. Got to have coffee with it every mm. time. But yeah, I, I, I never skip breakfast, but I, my current favorite is marmalade and yogurt or cheese and marmalade. Mm. Don't forget the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> beat cereal every day for me yeah and last question before i ask people where they can find more from you online is what's something that you do daily to stay in hormonal harmony i walk every morning mm. um I, I go for a walk after breakfast when i've dropped the kids off at school and i always make sure uh that i walk um uh that's pretty much the the main thing that i do uh drinking coffee every morning is, is always useful as well um and I, I take thyroid as well. So uh, I uh, maintain my thyroid with uh, supplemental thyroid hormone because I, it, it's since having the mercury thing, it was thrown it off and I do better. I live in a very polluted environment. So I believe that taking thyroid hormone is one of the most holistic, sensible things to do in a, in a very harsh uh, environment. So that, that would be my three things, um, walking, coffee with breakfast and uh, taking thyroid. Yeah, people, if they had... They think that taking a medication is bad, even if it is more of like a natural desiccated thyroid. But if you had diabetes, you would need insulin in order to function 100%. So yeah, you have to find some sort of balance between trying to do everything holistically um, versus being completely against conventional medicine. Yeah, and that's a very key thing that, you know, I was like that when I was more of a holistic health practitioner about 15 years ago. I was like, no, medication is so bad. It's like, but actually with thyroid, when you understand that it controls literally every aspect of your function from sleep through to metabolism, to fertility, to digestion, it's like, this is one of the key drivers. And it's like, you can, I, I used to take, you know, the natural desiccated thyroid and I've actually found that the synthetic thyroid, um, the ones that I use is just as good as that. And because it's not suspended in medium chain triglycerides and coconut oil, it doesn't irritate my gut as much. So, you know, I think it's understanding what creates good function and, and what doesn't. And, uh, you know, I think I'm still, you know, my research is trying to kind of challenge the, the idea that, you know, medications for single source actions like cholesterol, di diabetes, blood glucose uh, and hypertension are necessary when you get thyroid right. And, uh, you know, so I, I think that there are some aspects of medication that I think it just don't make sense when you go for the kind of hierarchy of creating change. And so that's why I think thyroid is essential for kind of managing those things. Yeah, you're going to be better off taking one single thyroid medication than an antidepressant, birth control pill, blood pressure medication, um, cholesterol um, medication, because it's the root of probably all of them. Yeah, don't get me started on serotonin because we do. <laughs> That'll be a whole nother episode. <laughs> Absolutely. So where can people follow more of your research? And I, you're one of my favorite followers on Instagram. So I'll tell people more about your website. And if they want to work with you, how can they do that? That's very kind. Thank you. Um, I don't have much of a presence. I am on Instagram as Tomo Littlewood. Uh, I have a Facebook page, Balanced Body Mind. My website is balancedbodymind.com. Uh, I've only written one blog this year because I've been working on seminars that members seminars for clients and practitioners who work with me so I, I will be putting some more out at some point soon and uh, I have a move back to, to the UK so I'll be doing more of that so yeah that's that's generally it and uh, Keith at balancebodymind.com if anyone wants to email thank you for letting me say that I appreciate that you're welcome and thanks for coming on the podcast and sharing your wisdom with us today
Pleasure. I'm always good for a ramble. <laughs>